I want to share an old story this morning with you, and it's about Jonathan and David. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Jonathan was the son of King Saul, and Saul was on the throne, and so Jonathan lived in the royal palace. He was royalty, and he was also next in line for the throne. But it's interesting that though he had all of that, Jonathan had a humble heart. Jonathan had a heart different from a lot of people who come into that arena of royalty, so to speak. And so he met a fellow one day by the name of David. Now David, he was a shepherd boy. He was out in the fields. He looked after his father's sheep. And he was the youngest in the family. He was kind of ruddy, which means the Bible says he was ruddy, which means that he was rather good looking. But he wasn't of a, a huge stature or a physical person that you would think would be someone that would come to save you. So he wasn't that strong. But David also had a very humble heart. And these two hearts came together and they bonded a friendship that most of us would be very envious about. They had a great friendship together. Now one was royalty, one was a shepherd. Two classes that you wouldn't necessarily expect to come together and, and have that kind of friendship. But as time went on, that friendship was challenged. And, and so Saul, King Saul, lost favor in the eyes of God. He did some things, he sinned and did some things and, and got to thinking he was a pretty good guy all by himself and could take care of things. And so God took the kingdom from him and said he'd give it to another. Now, Jonathan, remember, was the next in line for royalty, for the throne. Well, Jonathan understood that, that God had taken the kingdom from his father Saul, and David actually became the anointed of God for the kingship. And they went through a whole, a whole thing of um, getting, finding David, and, and Samuel had all of the sons of, of Jesse march before him, and and finally God said, that's the one. They had to go call a shepherd out of the field who was David and get him to go before him. And, and he said, anoint him. And so Samuel gets up and anoints him. So everybody knows already that the kingdom's torn from Saul and, and David's the anointed king. But Saul hangs on to the kingship for as long as he possibly can. And he tries to kill David. And, and, and Jonathan saves David from Saul in so many ways. And, and so you got to understand the mentality of Jonathan is that he had a heart for God. And so he recognized that when God tore the kingdom from him and gave it to David, that that was God's will and he would go with that. He recognized David as the anointed and David was faithful to God. He was humble and submissive. And so in all of that, that friendship wasn't torn apart. But in, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 20, Jonathan asked David to make a pact with him. He says, whatever happens, if I'm still alive, please treat me as your friend when you take the throne. Because the, the idea usually happened that when a new family came in and took the throne and they ousted the, old, the other family, that they killed everybody in the family. And so Jonathan says, don't do that. Now, we come to the part where Saul is killed, his sons are killed, Jonathan's killed, and David outright has the kingship. And I want to share with you that part of David's life as king. And it is in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 9. I want to share a part of his life that relates to our life. And I've called this sermon, Called by a King. 
See, David, after he gets the kingship, says, is there anyone left in the house of Saul? And people are looking at him and thinking, oh, he wants to annihilate them so that they have no chance of coming back on him. But that wasn't David's intent. David said, so I can show mercy to him on behalf of Jonathan. And so they said, well, there's one. There's this guy called Mephibosheth. Or Mephibosheth. Uh, say that fast five times and you have a mouthful. But he says, there's this young fella, but he's crippled in his feet. Now, I don't know what happened to him. If he fell as a baby, if he was dropped as a baby, if something happened or if he was born that way. But here is Mephibosheth and he is crippled in his feet. And, and so David's looking for anyone from Saul's family to show this favor to. Now I want to point out as I'm going along here how what David does with Mephibosheth is what we have as Christians today. You see, Mephibosheth was crippled. And you and I are crippled. I know you look at me and say, but look at I'm walking around, I got all the movement of my all my hands and everything. No, we are crippled. We are crippled in sin. And we've been crippled in sin from the garden on forward. In Romans chapter 6, verse 16 and 17, Paul says. When you give yourself over or you're obedient to someone, you are a slave to that someone or that thing. And he says, when you are a sinner, you are enslaved to sin. And when you're enslaved to sin, you're crippled. You're going to die. It's not a good thing. And he says, but praise be to God that you as Christians have been taken that sin have that sin taken away and you are now slaves of righteousness and so we we switch slaveries so to speak but in our life we're enslaved to someone or something and it's better to be enslaved to God than it is to be enslaved to sin but I want to use that passage to show that we are crippled Paul says in Romans 3 and 23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and so we are crippled in sin, just like Mephibosheth was crippled. But then David said, go find him, go get him. And they said, well, he's down in that town, low Debar. He's way away from Jerusalem here. He's gone to live with relatives. He's fleed because he's afraid of the king because the king might take his life. And so they go to this far place to find Mephibosheth. And that really relates a lot to you and I when we are in sin, if you think about it. In Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son, Jesus uses that and he says the prodigal son, the son that was living in sin, he got all of the inheritance that he wanted from his father, that he had coming from his father, and he went to a faraway land and squandered it. And what he's telling us in that parable is that when you're in sin, you're a far way off from God. There's a separation there. And, and, and so he says that prodigal son went to a faraway country. And for him to come back, he had to come back from that faraway country back to God. And it was the same with Mephibosheth. He had gone far away. And David said, go get him. Bring him back here. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says that it isn't God that has separated himself from us, but it is our sin that has separated us from God. And so when we're in sin, we're in a faraway place. But here's the grace in all of that. David calls Mephibosheth. The king calls Mephibosheth in, in chapter 9 of verse 5. And he says, I want you to come back. 
Now you've got to understand at this point, Mephibosheth is probably still hesitant because he's thinking, man, I'm going to go back there. Next thing you know, my head's going to be rolling on the ground because that's what they did to the families of the kings before them so that there was no threat of them coming against you and, and trying to take the throne back. And, and so he's probably still in that kind of dilemma, wondering what's going to happen. But he comes back. He is called by the king, or by a king. And you and I are also called by a king. And I want you to see that. In, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul says, starting in verse 8, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. We have been called by a king, by Jesus Christ, the king. He calls us to come back to him when we're in that faraway land, when we're in sin and we're separated from God. He calls us and he says, come back because this is where you belong. This is right for you. That other isn't right for you. It's not good for you. It's not going to end well. But I can save you from all of that. Just come back to me. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. I love the, the epistles of Peter. I think Peter was a um, just the way he lays things out. It makes so much sense and it's, it's from the heart. And Peter said in, in 1 Peter um, chapter 2 and verse 9, he said, But you are a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He called you from your sin. And he said, come and live in the light with me. It's much better for you. And so he calls us. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, Peter said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He's called us out of our sin. The king. He doesn't have to. He doesn't even need us. But he's called us, and he's called us because of his mercy. You know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22, and verse 14, that many are chosen, or many are called, but few are chosen. The many are called is everybody. Everybody's called by the gospel, but not everybody chooses to accept the gospel. But he calls us because of his mercy. You look at Mephibosheth. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 6 to 8, he comes to David, he gets there in front of the king, and he says, what would the king have to do with a dog like me? He calls himself a dog. And in Jewish terms, that was bad. That is not a good thing. And he says, what would you want with a dog like me? Why are you calling me? I am not worthy to be called by a king. And he falls down on his face on the ground before David. He says, I am at your mercy. And I want to say that we are at the mercy of God. Because if he didn't call us, if he didn't provide for us the salvation that he has, and he, didn't, and he did all of that because of his mercy for us, if he didn't do that, we would have nothing. We would be nothing. 
But it's because of His mercy. In, in Psalm 103 verse 8, David rejoices. And David went through a lot of things. And he experienced the mercy of God. And he says, you are so merciful. And you are so slow to anger. And he praises God for being a merciful God. And in Hebrews chapter, um, chapter 8, the Hebrew writer says in verse 13, he says, in speaking... No, that's not the right chapter. Just a minute. Hebrews, oh, chapter, verse 12. He says that God said this, and he's quoting scripture. He says, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. That's a merciful God. And we are at the mercy of God. And we need to understand that. Just like when Mephibosheth came before David and he fell and he said, what do you want to do with a dog like me? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about falling before the throne of God and saying, why would you love a dog like me? Because really, that's the truth when we're in our sin. But he's done that for us. Just like David did for Mephibosheth. You know, in, in Luke chapter 18, you have the tax collector and you have the Pharisee. And the Pharisee says, God, I really don't know how you've gotten along without me. I mean, look at all the things I've done and look at how good I am. And, and I pray and I, I do all of these things. And the tax collector beats his breast and he says, Woe to me, a sinner. Have mercy on me. Oh God. And Jesus said, the lesson there, the tax collector went away justified. You see, we are at the mercy of God and God doesn't owe us anything. He's called us because of his great mercy to be born again to a living hope is what Peter said. Because of his mercy. Not because we're good. Not because we deserve it. Not because we're even all that special. But he loves us. And because of his mercy, he's called us. And then look what happens. Mephibosheth is standing there before the king. And the king says, well, in, in verse 1 of chapter 9, he says, I want to deal with this young man in a right way because of his father, Jonathan. Now think about that for a minute. He was saved, so to speak, for the sake of another. And you look at that and you say, yes, yeah, so? In 1 Samuel chapter 20, I referred to this once already, but in 1 Samuel chapter 20, and starting in verse 14, Jonathan and, and, and David are having this conversation, and Jonathan realizes the writing on the wall, and that he's losing the throne, and David's the anointed of God, and all of that. And he says to him, he says, If I am still alive, show me the steadfast love of the Lord, that I may not die. And do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, May the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. And David never forgot that covenant he made with Jonathan. And so he says, because of Jonathan, because of the relationship Jonathan and I had, that pure relationship we had together, I want to save Mephibosheth. And I want to tell you that we are not saved because of who we are. We are saved for the sake of another. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, he says, while we were yet sinners... God sent his son to die for us. Do you understand that? 
while we were still while we were far off in a far away land, way away from God, he said, "Go down there and die for these people." Now, how many of you would do that? Be a challenge, wouldn't it? To die for someone that probably doesn't even want it. And yet he did that. So he saved us not because of who we are. He saved us and in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, he says, I want all men to come to a knowledge of the truth and be saved. Why are we saved? Because God desires for us to be saved more than we do. And so he enlightens us on our need for salvation and has already given it to us. And so we're saved for another as well. We are saved for his purpose. And sometimes I think we get to thinking that we're really good when we're saved because, I mean, we were good enough that God wanted to send his son to die for us. That's not the case. The case is he sent his son because of his purpose. Yeah, he loves us, absolutely. But it wasn't because of us. It's because of him that we're saved. And we need to understand that. And then the ultimate. Here's Mephibosheth. He's crippled. He has nothing. And David looks at this man and I, I would guarantee that pretty much everybody here would say that's the last person that you would raise up and put in a palace of royalty. Would, wouldn't it be? And David says, today and till, till you die, you are going to live in the palace and eat with me at my table. Now you think Mephibosheth was glad that he answered the call? I'll bet he was. Because he ate in the palace at the king's table the rest of his life. And I want to tell you something. That's the benefit that we have in Christ. That every day when we enter into Christ, when we're baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of our sins and we're raised up out of that water to walk in newness of life, we eat, so to speak, at the Lord's table every day with Him for the rest of our life. We are in the palace. Yes, we're living physically in this earth, but we are in His palace, in His kingdom. And we're with him and he's with us. And we have that life. In Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 starting in verse 10. He says, well let's start in verse 9. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He's delivered us from the domain of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We in Christ Jesus are restored to the kingdom. We are the king's subjects again. We eat at his table. We just ate at his table this morning. He sups with us when we eat at that table. We are with him. We are restored because of his mercy and grace. You know, you look back at, at Mephibosheth. He was thrown out. He was royalty. When, when he was the son of David and Saul was king, he lived in the palace. He was royalty. He got kicked out. His family was destroyed. He was rejected. And he ran away to hide. But he got called by a king, by the king. He was shown mercy. 
He was saved for the sake of another. He was restored to royalty. And in that picture, I want you to see our life as a Christian. Because we were all far from God. We had run away to a far land in sin. We were trying to hide ourselves in that sin. And we couldn't do anything about it. And we had to fall at the mercy of God. God called us back through Jesus Christ to be His children. He showed us mercy. He saved us. He restores us. But we have a king that is so much greater than King David. Because our king died fleshly as David did. But he came up out of that grave. And he ascended to heaven. And he reigns eternal. So we don't just sit at his table as long as... Well, we do sit at his table as long as he's king. But he's eternally king. So we're with him for eternity. And I would like to encourage you to remember that you are called by that king. And you have the privileges of that kingship. And when you're working with other people, we ought to remember that also. Because they need that king just as much as we need that king. And they need to answer the call just as much as we have to answer the call. If you're here this morning and we can help you with anything with that, we invite you to come where we stand to see. <coughs> I gave my life for Thee, my precious blood I shed, that Thou mightst ransom be and quicken from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for Thee. What hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? My Father's house of light. Oh.